My name is Edward Halecki. I'm from the virtualization practice, and I'm here with Neil Costigan of BehaviorSec. And we're going to be talking about continuous authentication, why we need it, and so forth. This is the 164th um, Virtualization Security Roundtable podcast and the 14th video podcast for the cloud and virtualization security. And Neil, you're from BehaviorSec. You're the CEO. Why don't you tell us a little bit about BehaviorSec? Um, thanks. Um, I'm, I'm CEO but, uh, by, by accident. I think I'm CTO by training and, and experience. So I, I, I'll give you an engineering answer to lots of what we're talking about. Um, BehaviorSec are a Swedish IT and mobile security company. We've been commercializing research from a university in the far north of Sweden uh, now on nine years now. Um, we had a lot of support from DARPA. Uh, we've been part of DARPA research funding and, and projects through the European Union. But over the last three years or so, we've, we've made a, a lot of commercial progress where we have managed to convince the banks that this continuous authentication based on behavioral biometrics can be a key layer in their user verification. Um, and so we've been successful in getting to all the banks in Sweden and Norway and Denmark. We've uh, the Benelux uh, projects, our banks in Belgium, Holland, Luxembourg, France, Spain, Switzerland, Germany, England. And so you can kind of see the propagation of our, our technologies. We, we, we kind of left our home base and got it out there. And what it is, is that this type of technology, behavioral, uh, about how a person interacts with their device, helps verify the user themselves, not just the context of the user or what they're doing. Uh, and also, it's kind of transparent. It's, it's very user friendly and essentially cost effective, where you're kind of taking the security and putting it back into the hands of the decision makers, the anti-fraud people and security people, rather than the um, rather than the individual themselves who, you know, can be overwhelmed, particularly in a retail and consumer kind of place, it can be overwhelmed with the, the security decisions and discussions. So, so really part of it is, is this technology is very suitable for um, consumer retail and where there's elements of fraud and usability coming into it. Well, but in the biggest question I've had for the last few years, actually ever since I met you guys, what, like three or four years ago, mm -hmm. the there's a need right now to verify the user at the end of the device, to know who that is. I mean, when I ask companies out there that do traditional identity, I say, can you tell me exactly who is using the device? And they say, oh, we use a password. It's like, well, that's, yes, it's something you know, but how do you know it's not duress or someone else isn't entering it? Yeah. And you got, and they go, well, no, no one would do that. It's like, yes, they do. Um, when you look, just look at any teenager. This is the next generation of our workforce. When you look at a teenager, they share their devices with their friends all the time. Yeah, yeah. And um, this, this that, is driving that question. Well, actually, the, the, this is the behavioral technology. What I spoke to an uptake in financial services and internet banking and that, uh, one of the things about behavioral is when the individual themselves doesn't want to be an actor in the security equation, doesn't want yeah. to participate, that I don't feel value and what I'm protecting. So normally banking, it's my money, they're giving me the pin, I'm not gonna tell anybody, I'll hide it at the ATM. You know, you're part of the equation. Same with say your corporate email and stuff, you're kind of like, that's my private thing, I'm not telling anybody. However, if you get into a thing, say like distance education or a paywall for a media center, something like that, the person goes, you know what, I want some help in this exam or I don't really, you know, I wanna share this article with my friend or this, this SaaS account. Behavioral is going to be really good in that is that you know about the person themselves. You don't know it's just that password, that pin, that device, that location. It's the one more. It's like the last mile that comes out of the device to the person themselves. But it's not, I mean, that's not that simple. I talk to people all the time and they really do not care about their pins for their bank accounts. I know. I know. It is, and, I mean, they, they take pictures of the credit cards and put them up online. I mean, this is really smart. Don't well, do it. An element, uh, there's an element that the consumer user doesn't feel they're going to lose out. I don't think, until you've been hit with identity fraud or identity theft, I don't think people see the ramifications. They kind of go, you know what, my bank's going to back this up. You know, I don't really care. Actually, I, not anymore. Really? If you use what? a chip, if you have like a chip and pin card in the U.S. and you're not using the chip and pin, yeah, they won't back you. Yeah, yeah. I don't think people quite pick that up. I really don't. I mean, there's some banks will say, well, that's as far as I'm concerned, it's fraud. We will not back you. Your loss. Wow. But the main thing is, is most people aren't reading their agreements to know that. But this is where behavior comes in because, I mean, I look at the teenagers in, this, in the, the cul-de-sac I live in, 
Mm. And they hand their phones over all the time. This is the next generation of the, of the workforce. They're not going to suddenly change the behavior because they're working for a company. That's very true. Very, very true. So they're going to be at a bar. They're going to be logged into their company email because it just happens by default. You unlock the phone and it's all there. Yeah, yeah. They're going to hand it over to their friend who works for a competitor or a supposed friend. Yeah. We need to know to shut all that stuff off. Well, that's also a part of it is I don't think people consider the compliance and data protection and, and these kind of things that the enterprise or their bank or whatever are, are, are subject to. So a lot of security, security measures are, are really about that. It's, 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 it's regulations, it's guidance, it's coverance. Um, and so some people look at the technologies going, this is very cumbersome. I don't want this. And so, well, it's not really up for you or, or that. It's, it's about the, the institution themselves and, and, and following best practices and doing their utmost to, to, to help the user, even if the user themselves doesn't want to, doesn't want to participate or whatever. Well, I, I agree with that. I mean, one of the things could be if I'm using and for me, if I'm internal to the bank, it's probably going to happen regardless. Mm -hmm. If I'm in a highly regulated environment, those regulations are drilled into everybody so they understand a certain yeah. level. Yeah. Um, I had a, I was talking to a, a person at RSA this year about identity, and there's three people in the car that are identity people, and they, that's all they do. And you have the driver of the car happens to be a, works at a bank. And they're talking about the latest identity things, and she just pipes up and says, I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> and they all look at her like she has three heads, and it's like, what do you mean you don't care? I don't care about the bank. I care about me. So she won't protect the bank. The bank well, has to protect themselves from her lack of willingness. Is that a is that a sea change from the current view of the banks? You know, the banks were this trusted legacy, you know, bricks and mortar authority and people through the practices that they've done over the last 10 years or so from the crisis and everyone was just like calling them out going no you're not special and not important and i don't feel you weren't looking after me i'm not going to look after you exactly uh, but but that's um that's part of it i think and, and technologies like ours and not just behavioral around interactivity like we have but also in you know, log file analysis and device identity and these kind of things are taking some of the security decisions away from that end person and putting them back in the back end. So our technology, we've gone to market two ways. You can do it all in, in the device, and we've got great work around that, and that's the stuff we did with DARPA. But generally, it's very light collection on the client, very invisible, very transparent. And in the back end, we're doing this behavioral um, profile analyzing and whatever and providing the data there. So it, it's, it's not that the person needs to care, you know, that they're not being asked to care. It's being handled by somebody else. I mean, like, for example, Starbucks could pick this up and for their app, put it in there and say, hey, I can identify the person using it as Edward. He can he can do that. But if it's like somebody else, I'm sorry, they can't charge. Yeah, that's uh, that's our vision. And NF that's NFV is I mean, if you think about the um, the new way of doing near field. Yeah, NFC, sorry, near, near field charging this actually could become extremely prevalent and incredibly important to do because you still need to know who's holding the device that says allow this charge yeah uh, i saw some uh, photograph veterans there was people with um a lot of credit cards particularly in the uk are touch and go for small dollar transactions so if you're doing something under about 30 dollars you can just touch the card and go it's for buying tickets buying a newspaper buying coffee go go mm -hmm. go put around the on the subway with, uh, with 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 readers and hitting hitting um, handbags and people just walking by and they were getting charges in because there's no there's no authentication there's no pin there's no status. Ouch. Yeah. Three dollars so, a day. <laughs> there you go. Uh, a lot of people don't notice that kind of behavior. They don't really see small transactions on their accounts and bills. You know, they quickly go through them and if there's four columns, they say, "What's that?" But three is like new ninety nine cents. It's just money. You know? Yeah, so, no. Uh, I mean, that's the other thing is, if you are a consumer, part of your job is to check your own bank accounts. I mean, yeah. I mean, I do it regularly. I get notified immediately on a charge that's greater than zero cents. Mm. So even the penny I'll catch. But well, the idea is, how many people actually do that? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I may have the threshold low enough. So it's a combination of things. If you're talking behavioral, like what you're doing, you're still relying a little bit on the consumer. 
to do the right thing, even so, or the person to do the right thing, even so. Because think about um, this way: if I put my device flat on a desk and use it that way, there's no motion. All you have is perhaps what they use on the device and the keyboard, but I lose out on motion, but not geolocation. Um, to be honest, uh, the modalities of the angle of the phone and the movement or whatever are very small. They're a little bit extra, but it's not the it's not a big thing to us. Um, area under the screen, depth of touch, acceleration of the speed, um, the frequency, the kind of rhythm of you typing is there, but the, the motion and angles increase a tiny bit, but, but they're not that significant. So when people do desktop flat down or whatever, we don't really flag that out. That doesn't really change it. That's if, that, you're that, doing, if you use a lot of motion on your phone and the next person doesn't, that could be interesting. Well, no, we, we, we do uh, analyze it and it is there, uh, but it's, 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 it's as part of the mix, it's not got huge weight. So how many different things ca do, you, do you think we should be tracking to identify the human? I mean, if it's flat on a table and it's pressure and, and that, what about turning on the camera? Um, I Other than so the invasion of privacy. We, um, as an engineer, the whole camera, camera facing stuff and, and the limitations of it are, are quite computationally expensive and limited. And there is a little bit of the uh, privacy issue around it. So if you're thinking of, if I had my phone and I was protecting all my things and my playing games, it was my essentially my pin on lock uh, and I made the decision of what's there, that's all very good. A lot of our customers are saying internet bank they're not going to ask the consumer user for that stuff. It's, it's, it's a step too far. So behavioral, you know, you can't really put a personal information from the person. You can't profile them. You couldn't pick their sex or race or age or illnesses as a potential um, uh, grouping or profiling about people. So it would fall into data protection laws. With swiping that, you don't do that. So there's one of the reasons the banks shy away a little bit from uh, physical biometrics sometimes is because they fall foul of complex data protection around biometrics. And so faith and camera are part of that. Okay. So the, the essence, in my understanding, of some of the data protection around a biometric uh, analysis and saving is that you have to use the biometric for the purpose you were given it. So authentication to the bank, fine. But you have to show that you cannot take that biometric and misuse it for other purposes, uh, like profiling people based on their race and their sex and their age and their illnesses at, uh, when you're doing this, or at some time in the future. And that's the real problem. I mean, we have no idea where this out of it. These whatever, sometime in the future. So most of the banks turn around and go, yeah, that's a step too far. I, I, I don't think I want to get caught up or involved in that kind of discussion and, and, and leave it. So I don't see back camera face stuff being that consumer um, uh, interesting. And it'll be there. They're, they're, you know, they're, it's great technology, pretty cool stuff. But just about the, the uptake, particularly in mass consumer. Uh, well, I, I have it would be in a highly regulated environment for an employee that may be required. There you go. Yeah, no, it, it, there's definitely tools for purpose. Um, you know, I, I, I'm a great fan of behavioral biometrics. I'm a cryptographer by trade. Uh, I've been 20 years making these protocols and, 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 and that kind of stuff. A lot of smart card work. Uh, they're very suitable for very important environment. You know, the, Fort, the keys for Fort Knox or the nuclear secrets shouldn't be handed over to, to a whimsy security solution. But conversely, um, there is no need in certain cases to have the strength and complexity and cost and unfriendliness of some of the security solutions in a kind of mass market consumer front of the way. But there are different scenarios. It's about looking at the problem and the risk and, and, and it's kind of risk reward about breaking security and applying a common sense and practicality to it. So that's kind of where it all adaptive slash continuous slash risk based. They're kind of all little parts of the same family. And that's, 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 that's where it comes into it. Now, one of the other things I saw at Innovation Sandbox at RSA was someone that came up with a RF identity. You know, people that have six or seven devices on them all the time, whether it's yeah. a watch or phone, whatever. Does that figure into any of this, or is that also stepping over the line? Because now I'm picking up what surrounds that, that, the person. I don't know if it's specifically, but if, if I'm second guessing what it is, I, know, I think that's that's a clever thing. That's a clever it is, idea. isn't it? It's yeah, just, yeah. I wouldn't. Um, I wouldn't. I, I straight off the bat, I don't see anything massively wrong with it. There might be a case of user approving what RF devices that they, they'll allow in the mix, you know, the wearables and, and environment and stuff like that. You know, so as long as the user kind of got some control and ownership, and it's not a pure 
malicious sniffing. Um, well, the I only think. way you could do that is to put your device in, in airplane mode so it doesn't broadcast anything. Yeah. You want to control it, you can. You go into the building, you just flip it on, you're done. You're invisible yeah. to the RF signal because you're not looking for Wi-Fi, you're not broadcasting your Bluetooth. You know, that all that communication is just not happening. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's not. Um, I'd like to see the implementation. I didn't see the sandbox this year. Um, it generally, throws up one or two really cool things. I mean, I, I'm going to go back and check it out. There's always some interesting things. This company um, was one of the ones I didn't expect to be there. Okay. Yeah. Because it was it was that that's not their primary what they primarily do. Yeah. But it's just a cool way of having yet another another layer of identity. Yeah. Associated with it, but. The other question is, I've been thinking about this one a lot, is as these teenagers become into the workforce and they start handing over the devices, are the analytics today good enough to actually tell one teenager from another? Oh, yeah, 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 they are. Yeah, it's um, uh, device identity may, you know, the device is getting very ubiquitous. There's, there's little, you know, it's, it, that, that's narrowing a little bit, but, uh, but basically people's behavior, it's not as if we are looking for robots and that very people are very much the same, but, uh, certainly from our big data analysis, yeah, there's no real differences across the age groups and the people and the frequent users and stuff. How much data do you really need to be able to do this? I mean, how much do I need to collect before I can say I got a, you have an identity? What's this, what, what, is it a small amount? Is it a large amount? I mean, no, no, it's, it's, it's relatively small. If, if again, think of the application area. There's, a, I keep mixing up the two things we do. Uh, but if I just think of an internet bank, and one of the reasons continuous uh, is part of this, that it's not just a login pin number, it's the, you know, username pin, the transaction amount, the pay, the account overview, the, you know, all the data. So you've got every step of the way. And in real time, we're, we're constantly calculating the likelihood that the person is who they say they are on each screen and each page. But part of that is, is that you're pulling in quite a bit of data. The kind of three typical user journeys of a mobile payment app or a uh, of an internet banking app, um, you know, there's three or four pages on it. Where we hold up and say we see somebody four or five times, we got high confidence. We, we'll guess who they are on the six. Okay. But it's, it's not a huge amount of data, and it's really only uh, statistical variances and stuff that we're uh, that we're plotting across. The actual storage and the profile size of ones we can take about it is, is, is relatively small. And computationally quite light as well, actually, compared to crypto on that. It's, it's, a, it's a rather passive thing. That's actually very cool. Because yeah. as we do that, then if I have the right apps, let's say I tie this into an Android device or so forth, I could actually write a tool that says, hey, let me go query that. You're not who it is. Let me turn it off at the server. So yeah. there's no communication, but whatever's on the device may stay there, or I can just close the app automatically if it's on the device. Yeah, I, I, uh, when we first got out of the door with this technology and we were doing it on desktop and, and had it kind of as a antivirus tool that was continuously in the background. And if you weren't who you say you were, it would, you know, in my world, it was just, you know, you could take out the person and shoot them. It's not them. They have permission to kill them, you know. But actually, the reality is it's more of an audit and a log and a, and a, and a prompt. And, you know, you know, it's a step up. Hey, the behavior's changed. Go and challenge them for a password or an OTP. And you don't necessarily kill everything off. And, and a lot of those decisions are policy. And quite often, actually, a lot of the policy is not recorded. You know, we know there's desktop sharing going on. We prefer if it wasn't there. But as long as we have audits and logs, uh, that will do. So, you know, the actual application of the technology is, is, is kind of domain and case specific and not necessarily what you would think, which is just stop everything. Is there a possibility that behavioral analytics such as these could um, aid in determining duress? Yeah, we get asked. We get asked a few questions about it, um, and just in the environments that we've been working on with the scale. I mean, we talk about we analyze, you know, four or five million users over quite a period of time and, and figure out the parameters. And we don't and, and and training and the weights and all that. We don't necessarily know many of those people are or aren't under duress. Uh, we would we would think so. We would definitely know if your behavior changes. It's not you, but whether that behavior change was because of duress is possibly beyond what we understand at the moment. We, 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 we need to kind of have capture of that. And how do you want to make somebody dressing or shout at them in the room or hit them on the head as they're typing? So we're not, we're not quite sure how we, we, we put it up, but, but it does come up a bit. And well, uh, that, you, if your behavior changes, we flag it. And that behavior could be from duress, but um, yeah. 
Well, when you think about it, it could be something like that because you have all this rich health data as well that's on the phone. Yeah. If you tie it into the health data apps that are collecting heartbeat and other th rhythm types, body rhythm things. Yeah, no, I. Uh, is that stepping I, over the line again, or is I, that... I, I could I could see it as an academic slash interesting for a small domain customer. It certainly wouldn't be, in my view, what mobile to mobile payment companies and internet banking companies ever will ever do. They, that's definitely far too far down the road. But in a you know, a, I said, yeah, imagine a. Um, High security environment, maybe you know, hey, um, a uh, air traffic control, something like this, where there's duress and there's time and stress, and it's important to monitor it and behavior changes. Yeah, definitely, I could think in that small domain. Or but if I you're in a bank and you have access to the vault. Yeah, yeah. So internal banking, particular customers, you know. So out of a, a ten thousand employee bank, there might be five or six that might might be relevant towards. But we're actually not talking about the ten thousand users in the bank. We're talking about their two million consumer users, and that's the sweet spot, and that's what we sell to today. I think as the technology has gone mainstream already, but goes further and gets developed to version five, six, seven, that there will be more application areas kind of afterwards. So internet banking, consumer facing, is kind of the early adopter and the first deployment, and and kind of you know who, who has the urgent need. But certainly, as as people are open up to the extra benefits of this and other technologies in our in our area, uh, we're going to see them across the board and in, in environments as you said, um, you know, high duress responsibility positions of the banks and finance in, in in trading in um in in in, in even politics uh, and and no, 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 they're always under duress so <laughs> i always show up um, i'm actually thinking um military like generals even their yeah. families yeah yeah i could um i could see so we did some darpa work and there's quite a lot of interest around it and various actors inside the, the you know the dod world uh, took the research and have gone places with it and uh, they were more likely to go into that world than we were you know but is it really identifiable information? I know it's health information like heartbeat and so forth. Yeah. But is it enough to actually identify the person? Well, you know, we're not necessarily um, taking some behavior and then going off to a big database and finding that person. More often than not, we are, hey, th this guy says he's Neil, is it? You know, so verifying a person is who they say they are is doesn't necessarily necessarily have the PII uh, and it doesn't necessarily have that uniqueness in necessarily or whatever it's it's really just a um, you know what's the, what's the likelihood that this person's behavior matches what they've done in the past that's 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 a lesser problem than picking up health data and trying to figure out what the individual is well but even if I do do behavior and all the different things that you mentioned I'm at least getting the user involved in the question about security, but at least in authentication, instead yeah. of relying on a, a, a some sort of code they may or may not know. And the reason, yeah. the, I mean, I was actually recently changing a password because I forgot it. It happens. Yeah. yeah. And I was confused. I went off and sent in the change password and they said, oh, would you like an SMS or an email? I'm going, I'm on my phone and both show up here. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah. I said SMS yeah. or email, whichever one it was, it shows up on my phone. So if the bad guy had my phone, was changing my password, sent that. that you that's know, exactly. That's this exactly, is a bad thing. Yeah, that's exactly the the use case that has made a few of our customers go one step more than the technology they had and add the behavioral part into it. Is that fact that uh, they're just not sure who has the device at all times. And you could detect that type of behavior and say, hey, don't send the SMS or don't, don't believe allow it. the change. Yeah, don't allow the change. You know, flag up and get something else. You know, step it up, step it up, and keep going. Yeah. So, so now that, you would need, yeah, but that, most... There's another, there's another attack that's called swim swap, sim swapping where people are basically changing numbers to try and get you to call them, uh, to, you know, social engineering and number change. And uh, uh -huh. they, they behavioral helps in that, in that regard as well. So when you think about it, the phone's not a safe device. Um, well, the, the, the ultimate is there's no silver bullet in the security world. Nobody's come out with the great one. So we're trying to make stronger and stronger and layers and layers and layers. The phone is pretty good, but it's not complete. You know, well, so the phone is yeah. good until someone else gets a handle on it, a hand on it, yeah. and it's unlocked. Uh, and well, you know, given the news this week, maybe even if it is locked, <laughs> even if it is locked, it won't make a difference. But when you start thinking about behavior, 
Now I have a different layer unless you have someone that can mimic that behavior yeah. very well. I mean, you, you, you see the movies about people that can do typing speed the same at the same as anyone. Yeah, but you, you, you know, you don't get an infinite time to try it either. You know, you, you, you know you've got a, a one or two shot. Go well, it just all you need to do is practice beforehand. Um, yeah, no, uh, you know, again, as I said, there's no silver bullet and I'm not prompting everyone up there. Uh, and I also believe it's mainly applied to areas where all that effort doesn't give you the reward at the end. You know, it's not as if you mimic the behavior of one person, you get their account for all that value and interest. You want to get that person's account. Attacks of quality and scale in, in cybersecurity or whatever want to get to break everything. You know, that if I spend all this money and all this time and energy, that when I go and carry out the attack, that I get an awful lot return on my investment of time and just breaking one person's behavior on a, on a consumer device or whatever. Certainly wouldn't give that. On what that who that person really is. Oh yeah, yeah. There sure. could be value in there. Now, could you tell a di I mean, is it the behavior good enough to tell the difference between a phone that has like a cover on it versus not? Because some people may put a like, could freak out and put a um, one of those OLED transparent OLED screens yeah. on it now to detect your way to press and all that. So anything we come up with is going to be a. A, 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 an attack against it in some fashion. Well, yeah. Generally, what happens then is your behavior changes, and we'll say, "Hey, this isn't you. Come on, you know, prompt up for that other authentication. You know, this door is closed. We're not accepting this. You know, so somebody is 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 fooling the behavior or, or, or trying to record it or whatever. You know, the, the countermeasures there will stop it and and, uh, and and put you back to where you are now. So a lot of the reason is usability. But you know, if it doesn't go right, where it isn't that you get in, it's it's a lot of the cases go and find that uh, that other that other token wherever you've left it in the drawer and find the back for it and that kind of thing. So it's, it's about yeah. So a token makes sense, but other information about the user does not. I mean, everybody knows my birthday. Everybody knows where I lived. I mean, this stuff you can get off of Google. <laughs> uh, yeah, but I mean, the ba the banks have long given up on that uh, stuff. I mean, I think if if I see maybe guys, in Europe. Uh, the, 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 the FA, FA, oh, FIEC compliance and guidance or whatever ha, has put them saying that stuff just isn't good enough. And they've done that about three or four years ago. And in theory, the banks have to, to, to step up and take that and not rely on such weak forms. It's funny is that I, can, I mean, right now to change online, to change a bank's PIN number or so forth is actually trivially easy. No, it's, yeah, it's not good enough, is it? It's not good enough. And yeah. it should require you go in the bank and bring a form of ID or whatever. But even those can be duplicated. So it's we, really, we've had that really event over here in Europe uh, some time ago, which it's, it's rather complex to do here now. Uh, and I think the North American banks are following suit. If, if I can, you know, not speaking specifically, but, you know, on the back of last year's and this year's, you know, marketing attempts or, or uh, things like RSA, we are getting much different questions and much more traction and interest from the financial institutions in North America for this technology than we did three or four years ago. Oh, uh, I would agree, because there's been they're, some they're directors. Too, they're, they're getting pretty busy about it too. Yeah. Well, not only that, fraud has just escalated to horrible numbers. There's a lot of people that have had their identity stolen to get their money, yeah. and most people don't even know it's happened. Yeah, and yeah, that's the thing, yeah, yeah. Um, but I mean, even the change to chip and pin in the U.S. has been, you know, fine, a long time coming, and now it's in. It hasn't been reinforced really hard, you know. Well, I, it's actually as, chip and sign. Chip and sign. There you go. Yeah. It's not even chip and pin for most things. Well. Which is actually good because one of the security measures I have on my card, one of my cards, is the pin is not known by anybody, not even me. Huh. And if it's actually the bank knows that if it's ever been used with a pen, that's fraud, outright fraud. So now with chip and pen, that can't be done. Hmm. So there's, there's now you have to think of another personal countermeasure to defeat people trying to steal your own stuff. Because now pins are required for everything. Yeah. Um... You know, and our, our premise is then that pin can be backed up with invisible, continuous background based technologies that really enhance that. So, you know, from, from device identity, geolocation to log file analysis to behavioral interaction, all these, particularly these, join together 
uh, should be, you know, used in tandem and in addition to. But there's a while away before we see that in point of sale devices and you know elsewhere. So. so it sounds like what I need to do is if I'm actually working with a bank and I'm traveling, I should actually tell the bank where I'm going so that if they are using you guys, you pick up geolocation. Oh, we, 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 we don't do geolocation. I, I, uh, we, we focus very much on the interactivity, but I do believe the banks do it. So you know, they have, uh, they'll know like, where I am, and if they match yeah. it to the file, says, yeah, I'm supposed to be there. They, I, I don't think they're at the stage yet where they would, you know, you'd be able to log in and report to them and then register. I think it's more that they, they would see, hey, you go to Safeways every Sunday in the states, this city, and the east side of the city, and you're doing, uh, you know, transactions, and all of a sudden you're in the Philippines and you're trying to buy a Rolls Royce. That's not you. So it's more dramatic changes than it is. Hey, I'm just reporting where I am. The annoying one is when they go, hey, you're in the Philippines, and you're going, yeah, I bought a ticket to go there, and you know, and I got a credit to buy a Rolls Royce. <laughs> Why did you stop me? You know, I'm I'm obviously exaggerating for effect here, but. It can be really frustrating. You know, we're back to credit card more than banking and internet stuff here. But you would think that you know there is enough intelligence in the systems to say, hey, that person, you know, left Europe, went to New York, um, because they bought a ticket to go to New York. And secondly, they're in JFK, the airport, rather than downtown. So it's possibly like that's fine, and they're spending relatively low limits. They should be able to see that. But I don't think I think the systems are a bit more crude than that. Which they, is um, unfortunate because you have this rich set of data based on your your yep. purchase history. You do, you do, but uh, I just, I just don't think that they're as uh, progressive and uh, enough. There will be, they will. This will come over time, and I think some of the new entrants into banking and the kind of non, you know, legacy large system old ones uh, would have a tough time changing. But I think people who come in with brand new thoughts, brand new ideas, and, and you know, wits with data scientists and stuff will start seeing an awful lot more intelligence. It sounds like we're doing buzzword bingo, but 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 with machine learning and big data, these are the, the application areas of it, definitely. Well, you need that because the, the volume of data is just huge, and for the entire bank, the velocity is, is through the roof. Yeah. Yeah, so no, that's, it is. Where do you think this is going to go? Um, well, right now, you know, we believe we have early adopting kind of proactive financial institutions playing with behavioral continuous stuff inside their app. Um, my vision and I can see the trend and I can see some movement in it, um, is, is that it's probably going to leave the app space and get into the overall ecosystem of the phone. Uh, Google announced it at the RIO. We've been doing work for DARPA, you know, and some of the handset manufacturers are keen to see what's coming next. But if you think if that we get a, enough behavior out of a login and a credit card transaction and exit, imagine what you get when you get the amount of interactivity with Angry Birds, with Facebook, with Tech. <laughs> Instagram, you know, yeah. fun sharing, swiping, drawing pictures, doodling, whatever. So all that in real time into the phone, in real time, providing, hey, this person is who they say they are with a certain level of confidence. Apps been able to query that in some secure way, saying, hey, I'm a banking app. Is it really secure? And uh, and the, the app saying, well, it's up to you. Here's the percentage. Or a game saying, hey, they want to log into a gaming center. Is it still in or are they cheating? You know, that'd be lower level or whatever. So a multi-layered, multi-scenario risk. In real time, the phones definitely got it. We, we have prototypes of this stuff. We've, we've had trials with thousands of people running around with full operating system behavioral uh, to show the value of it, see it. It's the application area and the wide scale distribution of it is what we're waiting to see. So, you know, we, 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 we see that it should become an integral part of the mainstream security equation, mainly driven by consumer usability getting kind of fed up with obstacles and extra steps and that insecurity. And if we can provide anything that get transparency and ease of use to the good guys and problems to the bad guys, that's going to be adopted. So that, that, that's where I see it going. Okay. And what I see is confusion reigning supreme. Yeah. Because I was just talking to, I mean, I've been talking to security companies for the last four weeks or so about all their new whiz bang things. And they're all there to say, hey, we've got to take the security out of the consumer's hands. Yeah. And my thought is actually different. I think we need to put it back in their hands. Well, and that's what I say the future. This is back in their hands. This is about in the device. This is about the user making choices and somehow describe to them in a way that they're making informed decisions. So user behavior, education across security is, is paramount, right? You have to have to educate people to know yes. the risk they're taking when they're taking shortcuts and when they're, you know, when they're, when they're opening the big heavy lock door and putting the chair in it, they, you know, they need to know the risk associated with that. So let's take it as a given that the security community has finally stepped up and made security 
understandable enough to the general public or whatever. But when they've made that decision and they understand what they're doing and they're going after it there, it's in the consumer's hands. It's definitely about consumer and retail and mass market tech. So how could behavioral analytics raise up this issue to the consumer without telling the bad guys at the same time? I mean, the whole step up is, well, if I'm a good guy, that tells me that something I did something different. But it would also tell the bad guy that they did something different. Yeah, but I mean, uh, you know, that's that's it. You're making it hard for them. You know, you're trying to step up should then be hard you know, to get over. Um, yeah, it's a it's a complexity, security level, uh, costs triangle that you're trying to play the best balance on or whatever. It may not get to the point that you're getting, you know, as I said earlier, Fort Knox level security in a consumer device. Uh, but you're also not getting for Knox level cost and inconvenience, and 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 as long as it's protecting apples, you know things like I said, you know I was making trivial of people's Angry Birds games, uh, but you know it's that level of stuff, possibly identifying users, knowing that they switch, uh, if they turn around and do um, very high value banking transactions, then there's going to need to be, hey, no, we're not we're not necessarily using some of these technologies, we're gonna we're gonna go back into the old world and do it. So. It's about it out of, uh, adapting to the risk and, 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 and ch checking the environment and not assuming that you'll get the full coverage for all things because they're not necessarily necessary. No. All right. Yeah, that's very yeah. interesting. And when you think uh, about where uh, you that, That's just where I see it kind of going, you know, that, 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 that we've been trying to plug very, very complex, expensive solutions into places that they're just not going to ever get taken up. And I think the market demands for needs and, and, and that are going to change. But it does come, as I said earlier, I, th I do think consumer knowledge and consumer education and informed decisions were a, part, a big part of that. You can't, you can't completely take the security out of the end user. That's, that's just too utopian. And I would agree with that. And one of the things is, is I actually think that we're not going to change the next generation of the workforce. They're going to spend 10 years using their phones with sharing them. That will yeah. not change when we go to the new, when they get into the workforce. They'll basically say, well, if you want me to do that, sorry, I'm just going to leave the company. It's my device. The whole yeah. BYOD. I've, I've gone through a transition where, you know, work environments in high security was didn't have connections to the internet and stuff. Yeah, and no, they, they and your employees come in and they kind of go, "Are you insane? I mean, how are we going to engineer and innovate uh, without connectivity to the intelligence that's in the network?" And you've seen a sea change. You're just going to have to adapt to that. So you know, the older people, older environment, older work kind of got that we were disconnected, and, and had a library, something like like you have behind you there uh, in every desk. But but now those people expect that library, the already library, to be virtual and online and, and searchable and gettable. And, and and the idea of working in an environment that wasn't connected. Just isn't in, in the mindset. So that there is there is a sea change. You'll get to that with the idea of telling people that you can't bring a mobile device home or into work. They just won't accept it. They just won't see that's the real world. Yeah, and they're going to say, "Hey, this is just my device. I'm going to use it." Even if it's the corporate device, they're going to say, "Well, I'll use it for whatever I want." I, I see that those technologies this is a bit of a side, but the the quality sandboxing products that that isolate um, the enterprise concerns versus the consumer concerns being better and better and smarter and smarter. That's, that's, that's another thing we want to see. So that idea of tying in a behavioral to that sandbox to say, hey, this really is the user with high yeah. probability, yeah. allow them to do continue doing work, but if it's their child, no. Yeah, no, there you go. So that, that, that's that continuous, that's that adaptive, that's that risk looking at it. You go like, if you're paying angry birds, who cares? If you're getting onto the corporate email, I want to stop that. That's where our technology is going to play when doing the job. So you All work, right. I mean, so now you see, you know, something like this being worked with AirWatch and, and Mass and all these other MDM, MDE, MCE, whatever you want to call them, device um, tools to con yeah. to govern content. Yeah. That's, um, you know, I think we have innovated the technology from an academic idea to be instrumental in bringing continuous to mainstream with support from DARPA, but you know, we informed DARPA to bring there, we informed Google to talk about it, and we're pushing it out. We, we got the banks to embrace it. And I think the banking and the scale we're at with the billions of transactions and the you know tens of millions of end users using technology have now woken up other areas of the security industry, the traditional security case from, hey, there's more to what, you know, there's something here and we should see it extended. So so application areas like sandboxes and, and, and secure devices 
but also the generic security products, I think, will become a bit more behavioral aware. Um, we, 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 you know, back on our company, I don't want to be promoting and sounding like I'm just pushing that product, but um, we, we have recent partners up with, with, with the traditional security vendors saying, our products plus this stuff is a better story, and we'll, we'll, we'll try it. And actually, if someone wants your product, they actually have to go through some of uh, um, the integrators or because you guys don't sell direct to the banks or direct to consumers. No, no, the banks buy it from us, correct? Yeah, the bulk of our deployments are banks licensing and operating it from us or in the cloud. The consumer, no. I mean, who who walks into Best Buy and says, give me a, give me a, a, a package of security software from my phone? It, it just doesn't happen. There was actually, a time. I have a feeling it's going to happen in the future. <laughs> I think uh, I think about forty thousand people, and most of them you saw at the RSA show a couple of weeks ago, will be the people to do it. But the other five billion on the planet, I think they expect the phone provider, the banking app, the telco, their enterprise they work in to supply that technology to them and be responsible for it. I just don't think the consumer is as aware as as, as we would like them to be. Um, unfortunately, you know, unfortunately, that I think is the reality of it. And that's actually, I mean, it's important for a security per company and per professional to realize is that the consumers are not there. Uh, Some yeah, of them, 40,000 of them, as you said, maybe, but most of them are not. And a lot of them, like, for example, it took me three years to teach uh, my family members not to click on everything. <laughs> you know, yeah, I wish I could do that. <laughs> and then that, now you have sandboxing technologies that make, hey, don't worry about it, just do it. You're right. They're getting better. I, I have to say, um, you know, the browsers themselves have got much, much better and stopping that. And I think even our clients and the amount of spam and stuff that the good services, you know, the big vendor services are, are killing. I think I think they're doing a good job. I think we're on the other side of those things. Um, but that doesn't mean that, you know, they're, they're more complex attacks there. But certainly less problems than it were a couple of years ago. Now, would uh, behavior, when you start thinking about this, would behavioral analytics be a good match for um, the content access security brokers for SaaS providers and, and the management sides of clouds? The thing about it, it actually makes a whole lot of sense. They do behavior on what's normal for a user to do, but they don't have the behavior on what's actually at the other either end of the device. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, just, just, just there's, there's a lot of people interested in this technology. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be cautious about. Um, so the answer you know, is yes. It would be a cool idea. Good news. Yes, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, so a lot of people are saying that it's a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> um, as I said, I was in the ad centers a few times. I think the early adopters have, have taken it mainstream, and banking is the first step. But the follow-on steps of, of 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 desktop sharing, of SaaS providers, of taking shared accounts, of offering identity services. That, they're the people who are kind of walking away from our boots at the trade shows and doing our demos and downloading stuff. So that the actual people asking are very different. It's not the anti fraud people from the bank as much anymore. They, they got it. They know about it. They've heard the analysts talk about it. They've seen it for years now at the shows and are implementing and have adopted it. And many of them, as I said, across Northern Europe have. But uh, true um, events like RSA, we're, we're finding people from all sorts of um, the main problems for security saying, yeah, I see where this one's going to be, not just a problem and an overhead to our uh, environment, it's actually possibly a better thing to have. Yeah. So you also said you were a crypto analyst. And by the way, I went past your booth a dozen times while I was walking to and from meetings. You guys were always busy. Yeah, it, I, you know what? I think people are very intrigued with this new stuff. I, 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 I was my uh, 18th or say show. 18, now I've been at the Beijing, Singapore, London and Amsterdam. I've spoken at quite a few of them. Uh, but a lot of the big vendors around, and I don't want to knock them because they're innovative anyway, but they're at version seven, eight, and nine of very comparable technologies. And, you know, I think people are around those shows and all of a sudden they see this and go, this is different. I get this. I understand this. So people are very intrigued. And I love showing it off, actually. And I love when it works. And I love uh, I love the comments we get back saying, you know, I've shown it off to my friends and it's great. So, yeah, we're very busy, um, it's, uh, which is cool. It was actually a very busy show altogether. I mean, that was the biggest one I've ever been to. Yeah, I mean, it was up up from before. There's particular times. Um, there's the Monday night part, which is only open to people who paid the you know attendance fees and stuff like that, and journalists and that. Uh, that's very quality. Uh, by the time you get to Thursday lunchtime and they've opened the doors to anybody who shows up, and you know it's overwhelmed with people looking for pens and t-shirts and stuff. It can look busy, but it's not. It, 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 it's kind of nonsense for a while. So it can it can dilute quite quickly with the big crowd. But um, 
yeah, the um, it's big, it really is. I remember 150 of us sitting in the Fairmont on the top of an uphill in a dark room with no windows. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, the RSA show was very much crypto, uh, and you know, R, S, and A were the main parts of it. Yeah. Uh, now, now it's a big Rasmus show, and I think they do it really well. Um, I, I do think most people there uh, come back year after year and get a lot out of it. And San Francisco, of course, is great to be in too. So. Wow, it's a long flight for you guys. Oh, I managed to do Seattle, a night in Seattle, a pass for Reykjavik. I was in London, I was in Nice, I was in Aix, I was in Stockholm at home before I got home. I did eight, eight, eight beds in nine days on the way home from RSA. Wow. I know. Um, but actually nowadays we can fly direct from Stockholm in 10 hours on these new Dreamliners uh, into, into Oakland. Very good. Beautiful planes. They're very quiet, and the pressure isn't there, and it's it's the the seats are all ergonomic, and the lighting's all really cool. And you, you know, ten hours later, you're in, in Oakland. Before it used to be about sixteen hours, and there was a connection in somewhere like Frankfurt or New York or Chicago. So uh, yeah, it's got very very easy for us. So I'm out, I'm out there for two months at least. And this is, I mean, the show itself. I mean, last year it was only around thirty thousand, thirty two thousand, I think it was something like that. It's yeah. grown by eight to ten thousand people just this year alone. The yeah, year before that was around twenty five thousand. So it's actually been growing. Yeah. But this was huge. And next year I expect it to be even bigger. Uh, and before we would get busy periods and then there'd be a, a little bit of time at a booth and you could be, you know, twiddling your fingers waiting for somebody to show up and just chat with your colleague. This was full on. I mean I think from I was at the AGC event on the Monday and I'd meetings every half an hour. I was pretty much booked by analysts, journalists customers and and just just both uh, every half an hour all through the show i was in pieces by the end of it it was, it was quite a, 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 an endurance test but we came back we had a really really good group meeting on thursday night overviewing the show and looking at the highlights and the customers and the profile and one of the things as well was the questions it wasn't what is behavior biometrics it was hey the behavior biometrics well, how do you do this particular part and integrating into this and you said in a recent announcement you did, and they're very in-depth stuff there were layers of understanding more that's reflected too with say RFPs and RFIs we get. We used to get like an email saying, hey, we want to see what your technology is about. Now we're getting a 70 page stack about performance and platforms and interoperability and standards and vision and direction. And you know, there's much, much more understanding of this whole area the last few years, which is, which is great. So as, I mean, as these new devices, I mean, I do have another question about this, the, the, the whole behavior. As these devices include more and more like motion and, and more and more capability. Yeah. You know, how, I mean, do you see an end to gathering any type of data soon? Um, is, is there a limit? That no, makes I mean, sense. Uh, in, in theory, you know, the approach we had, the, one of the sea changes in this whole area was the day we went from uh, making people type predetermined text and going to a training period to going to fully transparent and using kind of gestures and free text and free opening. So when, when we had the computing capability and the algorithms and the vision to take everything to do it continuous and not specifically retrained, uh, all of this is more and more modalities, you know, from first bringing in touch on the screen to bring an area on their skin to getting acceleration. And so we're constantly innovating, constantly analyzing them and constantly you know, looking at them and what make a difference. Uh, pressure was a nice jump. Pressure is quite a bit better than phones without pressure. Um, um, and uh, you know we prototyped and have the the smartwatch as an input as well, uh, the dual input, and if people are acting there, uh, so it, it increases stuff little by little by little. Um, so no, I don't I don't think there's any kind of finite limit to what we need to get. Uh, I think lots of things improve. It's kind of only when you get the new stuff, you analyze a bit of, of data on it, and and do some uh, number crunching that we see how significant things are. Some things that seem very obvious aren't as good as you think. Some things you think that are uh, nothing turned out to be quite important. Uh, the algorithms. I should say we, we did a graphic recently. We, we plotted out how the ML is making its decisions over time as a person trains on a profile, and it's just fascinating to see the the neural net kind of get to decision points and try new ways and then come back again and come to the end. And so we have to do a lot of simulation and analysis of that to um, to come up with these really thin good parameters. And as I said, we can plot them in the different modalities, and not everything is equal. Um, so we like to try and keep looking at new and new things, but we're not necessarily sure what what what, what the end of that is. So, so I, you know, we would, we wouldn't close the door on anything. And the thing is, is that Apple and Google and and everybody's coming out with so many new things. I mean, the Apple Pro with the finer resolution and the depth touch on it, and also the pen. And, you know, the the pen they created the pencil. I mean, it's been around for ages, but yeah. 
now they you get to use things very differently. Right? Oh. right? I, love how they, I love how they create things that have been there forever. <laughs> but when you think about it, now that's even more modalities of the same exact thing that you've been looking at before. Now it's like a thin line versus a, a, a fingertip. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it gives uh, you a different way of looking at things. Yeah. Um, time will tell. We will, we, you know, we'll be watching, analyzing, and trying them out. As I said, watches the stuff we played recently. It was pretty cool in some parts, and you know, it's kind of not as good in others. And yeah, you know, we'll see. Well, that one I'd like to know a little bit more about because I do own a watch, and if I can make it be part of my security equation, that would be great. Well, well we're at the R stage of R and D and and playing with it. We we need to get some numbers on it and possibly do some more larger trials. Um, we stopped there, and we can have the phone. You can tap out and. One of the things is uh, just about the uh, precision and, and, and stuff of the data. It's quite blunt at the moment and not necessarily as precise as we like. But you can do things like make people follow a pattern and get them to type it and, and, and that, and we can see the behavior and see it up on the screen. Um, but it's just, just work, just the kind of stuff we'll see in next generations of a product, not necessarily stuff they'll have tomorrow or, or on that. Oh, of course, of course. Well, Neil, it's been a, a lovely talk conversation. Yep. Thank you for joining us. I, I hope you got something out of it. I hope there's something you can use. Um, uh, I've quite enjoyed the questions, a good context, and always, always good to to kind of get a chance to describe this to to you know to to make sense of it ourselves. There you go. So thanks, thanks again for your time today. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. No.